Many of our talks have dealt with the interpretation of portable chest x-ray images. However, if you've ever wondered how a portable chest x-ray image is created, whether you're a patient, a radiologist, or other healthcare provider, this talk is for you. We'll tackle this talk in four parts. We'll start with some x-ray basics, and then explain how traditional x-ray films and modern x-ray detector panels work. We'll give you a tour of a portable x-ray machine, and finally, show you how an x-ray tech shoots a chest x-ray of a patient's chest. In order to create a portable chest x-ray, an x-ray tube is placed anteriorly in front of the patient's chest, and an x-ray film or x-ray detector panel is placed posteriorly immediately behind the patient's chest. When an image exposure is made, a beam of x-ray photons are fired from the x-ray tube at the patient. Some of these x-ray photons are stopped by dense substances inside the patient's body, like bone, while other photons may pass through the patient's body and hit the x-ray film or detector panel behind it to help create the image we'll interpret. Since the x-ray beam travels from anterior to posterior relative to the patient, pod, uh, portable chest radiographs are also referred to as anteroposterior or AP chest x-rays. Now, the relative positions of the x-ray tube, the chest, and detector are important because the x-ray beam is cone-shaped, moving the x-ray tube closer to the patient can result in apparent magnification of the patient's anatomy on their chest x-ray, while pointing the beam at an angle towards the patient may result in distortion of the patient's anatomy on their chest x-ray. If the x-ray beam is not angled but shifted too high or too low, then a portion of the patient's anatomy may be excluded from the chest x-ray. Obviously, the same thing applies if the film or x-ray detector panel is shifted too high or too low, too. Besides position, we can control the voltage and current across the x-ray tube's filament, in addition to the exposure time of our image. These variables allow us to manipulate the total number of x-ray photons we fire at the patient's chest and the amount of energy each individual x-ray photon packs. Since not every image, since not every patient is the same size, the optimal amount of current and voltage may vary from patient to patient and needs to be correctly selected. If we deliver too high a current or voltage to our x-ray tube, we may end up delivering too much radiation to our patient. While if we choose too low a current or voltage, we may get a noisy image since there's not enough x-ray photons to make our image with, or we may end up with an image with reduced dynamic range, which can make it hard to distinguish one anatomical structure apart from another on the chest x-ray. In a perfect world, every x-ray photon that hits our x-ray film or detector panel has traveled in a straight line. However, that's not a safe assumption we can make for every x-ray photon. In larger patients, it's possible for some x-ray photons to hit something, get deflected, and then hit a different spot on the x-ray film or detector panel than it originally would have. These scattered x-ray photons may cause our x-ray image to appear more noisy or more blurry, which can make it tougher for us to interpret the patient's image. That's why in some patients, we'll put an anti-scatter grid in front of the x-ray film or detector panel. This grid is made of many thin, relatively parallel strips of lead and can help prevent errant x-ray photons traveling off angle from reaching the x-ray film or detector panel. Now let's take a close look at the x-ray film or detector panel that captures our portable chest x-ray image. There are three strategies for doing this, and one of them has been in use since the late 19th century, conventional film screen radiography. With conventional film screen radiography, we capture a patient's chest x-ray image using a sheet of plastic that's coated with a layer of light sensitive silver halide crystals and then coated with a layer of phosphorescent crystals. Whenever an X-ray photon hits the phosphorescent crystal layer, the phosphorescent crystal at that spot converts the X-ray photon into a photon of visible light. The visible light photon then converts an adjacent silver ion within the silver halide layer into a neutral silver atom. 
The film is then developed. During developing, the film is bathed in a developer solution that changes neutral silver atoms on the film into black metallic silver grains, converting what was a latent image into a visible image to our human eye. The developer solution is then rinsed away with water and the film bathes in a fixing solution that removes any remaining unexposed silver ions. The fixing solution is then rinsed away with water and the film dried, resulting in a permanently captured chest x-ray image. Computed radiography, or CR, is a more modern technique for capturing a portable chest radiograph image. With CR, we take a plastic sheet and cover it with a layer of storage phosphors. CR works differently than traditional film. When an X-ray photon hits a storage phosphor crystal on the sheet, instead of immediately converting the X-ray photon into a visible light photon, the storage phosphor crystal at that site stores the energy delivered by the X-ray photon instead. Sometime after the CR sheet has been exposed, it's fed into a scanner where the entire sheet is scanned line by line from top to bottom by a red laser. During this scanning process, whenever the red laser scans a spot where a storage phosphor crystal exists in which an X-ray photon had previously deposited energy, the storage phosphor crystal will release a blue visible light photon that can be detected by a photomultiplier tube and mapped to a particular pixel in a digital image matrix. So what's the benefit of CR over traditional film? Well, the process of depositing and releasing energy within storage phosphor crystals is a reversible process, while the conversion of silver ions into black metallic silver grains isn't. So the same CR sheet can be reused over and over again, while a traditional X-ray film is a use-once medium. The third and newest strategy for capturing a portable chest radiograph image is digital radiography, or DR. There are two forms of DR, indirect and direct. With indirect DR, the X-ray detector panel is composed of three layers, a TFT array, a photodiode layer, and a phosphorescent crystal layer. With indirect DR, whenever an X-ray photon hits the phosphorescent crystal layer, the phosphorescent crystal at that spot converts the X-ray photon into a photon of visible light. The photodiode layer then immediately converts the visible light photon at that spot into an electric charge at that same spot, which the TFT layer registers as a black pixel. With direct DR, a single semiconductor layer replaces the phosphorescent crystal and photodiode layers. Whenever an incoming X-ray photon hits a spot on the semiconductor layer, that event is immediately converted to an electric charge that the TFT panel registers as a black pixel at the corresponding spot. One of the benefits of DR portable chest radiography over CR is that the image is directly created within the detector panel and there's no need for an intervening laser scanning step. Most modern portable X-ray systems are composed of an, a, a DR detector panel, an X-ray tube, and a computer. The DR detector panel is powered by a rechargeable battery, and the DR detector panel can transfer X-ray images wirelessly to the computer, which itself can upload that portable chest x-ray image to the hospital-wide PAC system via Wi-Fi so that anyone in the hospital can immediately see the patient's portable chest x-ray image on their computer. This is what a portable x-ray system looks like schematically, and this is what a portable x-ray system looks like in real life. The system in this image is in a stowed configuration and ready to be pushed anywhere um, in the hospital. This is a side view of the unit, and this is what it looks like in front and in back. Like a shopping cart, you can see that there's a large handlebar on the back of the unit for pushing it around. Going back to the side view, you can see an x-ray tube that's mounted on, on an uh, extendable boom 
which is itself mounted on an extendable column that can be raised or lowered and can also rotate, which allows us to unstow the system. Mounted onto the extendable boom is the x-ray tube. The business end of the x-ray tube is pointing down in this image, and we have three degrees of freedom in pointing the x-ray tube. Pitch, yaw, and roll. The x-ray tube can fire both x-rays or visible light, which allows us to see exactly where the x-ray beam is pointed and how large that beam is. Collimator knobs allow us to cone up or cone down the width and length of the beam. And here's a closer look at those two knobs. There's a large touch display on the console of the unit, which looks like this up close. Most of the important controls are in the upper left corner. This is where we adjust the x-ray tube current and exposure time. This is where we adjust the peak x-ray tube voltage. There are some presets for small, medium, and large patients. Since this is a portable x-ray unit, we've got a handy battery level indicator here. And this round green indicator lamp lights up when the capacitor that powers the x-ray tube is charged and the tube is ready to be fired. Let's look at the rest of the back of this unit. On the right side, we have a trigger that's connected to the unit by a long cord. This is what the trigger looks like, and there are two buttons on it, one for firing visible light out of the x-ray tube um, unit, and one for firing x-rays. We've got a number of storage spaces um, in the back too, one of which holds a wireless x-ray detector panel. The detector panel is about half an inch thick. On one edge are some small LEDs that indicate error state, wireless data transfer activity, and battery charge. One side of the panel is completely covered with carbon fiber, and the other side of the panel looks like this. The gray rectangular object inserted on this side is the panel's rechargeable battery, and this is what the battery looks like. Another, another uh, storage space in the back holds the anti-scatter grid for the x-ray detector panel. Here's what the anti-scatter grid looks like. The anti-scatter grid looks kind of like a shallow tray into which the x-ray detector panel can be snapped into. An extra rechargeable battery for the x-ray detector, um, detector panel is kept here. And you can see tiny electrical contacts at the bottom of the battery slot for charging. Finally, a supply of plastic bags are also stored in the back for us to put the detector in so that we can minimize the spread of germs from one patient to the next. Finally, you'll notice that in addition to the primary touch display, a secondary touch display is present on the x-ray tube head, which duplicates many of the most important functions present on the primary touch display. When it's time to shoot a portable chest x-ray, the X-ray tech will push this entire portable X-ray unit in its stowed state to the patient's room. The patient will usually be lying on a gurney. After saying hello and introducing themselves, the X-ray tech will confirm that they're about to X-ray the correct patient by asking the patient for um, at least two, um, asking the patient two different questions to confirm their identity. They'll ask the patient to provide their name and their date of birth. Once the patient's identity is confirmed, the x-ray tech will try to raise the head of the bed and place the patient in an upright or semi-upright position if they can. Next, the x-ray tech will move and unstow the portable x-ray machine and position the x-ray tube above the patient and near the foot of the gurney or bed. In ICU patients where the patient is often sedated intubated and lying flat, the x-ray tube would be placed directly above the patient's chest. However, in patients who are on the wards or in the ED, usually the patient is able to sit up, and so we place the x-ray tube at the foot of the bed. The x-ray tube then pulls out the x-ray detector panel, which is the white panel on this image, and the anti-scatter grid, which is the black panel 
on this image. For thin and small patients, the amount of x-ray scatter that occurs is usually much less, and so the anti-scatter anti grid um, is not used. For other folks, we'll use the anti-scatter grid, which easily snaps into, um, snaps together with the x-ray detector panel. The x-ray tech will place the entire assembly into a plastic bag and place it behind the patient, between the patient's gurney and their bed sheet. It's important that the detector can capture both the patient's lungs completely. The x-ray tech will make sure the panel is therefore properly centered using the spinous process of the patient's C7 vertebral body as a marker for midline and use their intuition and experience to make sure that the detector isn't too high or too low relative to where the patient's fully expanded lungs may be. Once the x-ray tech is satisfied with the position of the x-ray detector panel, they'll position the x-ray tube so that it's situated 72 inches from the x-ray detector panel. They'll also turn on the visible light beam from the x-ray tube to see where the x-ray beam will eventually go. In this case, you can see that the center of the beam is actually aimed at the patient's neck and not their chest, and that we're also firing beam at the patient's face and eyes. Um, exposures we certainly don't want to subject the patient to for a chest x-ray. So the tech will reposition the x-ray tube so that the beam is now centered on the patient's chest. Next, the x-ray tech will need to decide if the x-ray beam is wide enough to go through both of the patient's lungs, or if it's too wide and needs to be collimated or combed down. In this case, you can see some of the visible light beam falls on the patient's arms. Since we don't need to be exposing the patient's arms to x-rays during a portable chest x-ray, the x-ray tech cones the beam down horizontally so that the beam goes through the patient's lungs, but not their arms. We also don't want to be firing x-rays at the patient's jaw, neck, and mid-abdomen for a chest x-ray, so the x-ray tube, so the x-ray tech will cone the beam down vertically as well. All of this takes um, a bit of experience and intuition, as it's a bit of a conjecture as to where a patient's lungs begin and end just by looking at their body. Once the x-ray tech is satisfied with the placement of the x-ray detector panel and the x-ray beam, they'll choose the appropriate peak voltage and current for the x-ray tube for this particular patient. The x-ray tech will then take the trigger button and put some distance between themselves and the x-ray tube. When it's time to take the patient's chest x-ray, they'll ask the patient to breathe in, breathe out, and then breathe in, and they'll trigger the x-ray exposure at the end of the patient's second breath in to hopefully get a nice, well-expanded image of the patient's lungs. The image captured by the DR x-ray detector panel is wirelessly transmitted to the computer within the x-ray unit. And the x-ray tech will check to see if the image they just took is acceptable. And if it is, the image is uploaded via Wi-Fi to the hospital-wide PAC server so that the image they just took can be viewed by a radiologist at their workstation.